please welcome to the stage Senior Vice President, Java Platform Group at Oracle and Chair, Open JDK Governing Board, George Saab. All right, welcome back, everyone, and welcome to Java One. I'm so honored to be standing here with you today as Oracle brings back the world's original flagship Java conference. Java One represents technical innovation that Java has offered for more than 27 years. It also represents enterprise value and community participation. Over the next three days, you'll experience a range of content spanning the depth and breadth that Java brings to the world. You'll learn more about the most recent Java 19 release that was just made available in September, and also where Java is headed. Throughout the event, you'll experience five key themes to Java. Uh, the first of those is performance. As we look to address the challenges of modern application development, we want to ensure that Java continues to deliver increased performance with each new release. Second is stability. Now, for many of you, ensuring your uh, past investments continue to have future value is paramount. And you'll learn more about how we're addressing this. The third is security. In an ever-changing world with increased vectors of risk, our Java team continues to invest in making Java a secure language and platform to build applications. The fourth is compatibility so you retain the choice and the flexibility of runtime for your Java applications. And finally, maintainability. Be kind to your future self by choosing a platform that encourages writing maintainable code. And with that, to explore unique development tooling addressing these themes, it's my pleasure to welcome Olivier Gardin, the CEO and co-founder of Sonar Source. Hi, everybody. Thank you, George and Tim, for inviting me here. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about the clean code, and more specifically about the power of clean code. But before I do this, I just would like to uh, come back a little bit in, in time and talk about really what happened in the last 30 years of software development. I actually started to develop myself in, uh, I think it was 25 years ago on Java. It was version 102 of Java. And what was great at the time is that Java has just arrived as a new language, which was supposedly be a better language. But I think what it came with was really more than the language, it was a platform, which is, it was not about the language itself. It was about other things that comes with it, um, dependencies, things like commands that you can use, etc. It, did, it didn't exist at the time anywhere else. And I think the fact that it was part of the platform enabled actually engineers, developers, and the whole community to focus on other things, more high-level things. So a few years later, we started to see a lot of work around DevOps, all the process, how do I um, actually deliver software better? How do I put in place some processes, toolings that will enable to have better predictability, repeatability, and also sometimes just to know what we are delivering? Uh, you know, back in time, sometimes it was like, uh, okay, we are shipping version XYZ, but we don't really know what is in there. So that's a, a lot of improvement. We have worked a lot on this. And, and the big question for us, and I think for all of us here, is really all of this having like a very strong platform, very solid, very robust, secure, plus all these processes and tooling, which enable to deliver more pre um, in a more predictable way uh, our software, does it help us and enable us to develop 
to deliver better software? That's a big question. And I think the answer, I'm sure you would, uh, you would agree with this, is not really. We are, we are not there yet. I think there is a fundamental component that is missing in the equation here, which is it is absolutely necessary to have these two things, but it's not sufficient. And to, to develop great software, you actually need to have great code. <clears throat> because if you think about software, the real thing that matters is really the source code. Everything else, I would argue, is going to be commodity, maybe disposable. It depends how you look at it. Source code is the only thing that matters. It's going to really dictate how your, your software is going to behave, i.e. what service, what function is it going to render to the business. And also, it's going to dictate how the software is going to perform. You know, all those things that we, we tend to forget when we develop software, which is we expect software to be robust, maintainable, secure, safe, sustainable, durable, etc., etc. All these properties of the software, which are never written in any, um, in any specifications, they are actually absolutely necessary for your software to, to be a great software. And this is at SonarSource what we are really doing, which is to focus on, that, on these properties, on these characteristics of the source code. And doing this actually has a lot of benefits. You can always look at this as the half full glass or the half empty glass. I'm going to look at the, at the benefits. Um, you could also look at the, at the problems here. Four big benefits. One is clean code will enable you uh, to have your software last longer in production, which is increase the longevity, um, which in other words means your software, because it's going to stay soft, you will be able to, it's, it will be possible that it continues to render the service it is supposed to be. Um, if you think about it, if your software is not soft anymore, you should probably call it something else. Um, the second thing is that clean code will enable developers to have a better life, to do collective, um, collective ownership of code, and to not work on low-level tasks, on like rework, etc., but more to work on more added value task innovation on really bringing uh, value to the business. The third thing is about cost of maintenance, which is huge. Actually, if you ask developers what they spend their, really their time on, um, most of the time is today spend on maintenance. Why? Because every time we want to change the software, it takes time to understand the code. It's not written, it's not written very consistently. <clears throat> it's too complex, etc. So it takes a while to make changes. And as soon as we make changes, then we have to do a lot of testing because we are not confident that we haven't broken something. And finally, clean code enables to keep um, the risks of operating a software low. Basically, in, in other words, your operational and security risk, they are going to stay low if your code is clean. I think there is a start to be an <clears throat> understanding that the biggest security problems are actually not security problems, but they are more code problems nowadays. So in, a, in other words, if I summarize this, um, clean code will enable to keep software being an asset rather than becoming a liability. Now, I'm pretty sure that none of you uh, really learned something, or maybe you did learn something, but most of this is pretty intuitive. We know that, we have known that for many, many years. So, so why is code not clean today? And to me, to me this is down to really two, um, two problems. One is, for a very long time, there was no way to have a quick feedback loop when you, when you do code. So basically, if you wanted to, um, to, to review the code, the, the quality of the code, you basically had to wait long enough that you were bored or you had pushed your uh, changes already. So all of this was basically coming late. And the second factor is that when organizations or teams or developers decided 
to um, actually look at the quality of the code, what happened is that very often it was delegated to another team. It was not owned by developers, which is a fundamental problem. Code belongs to developers. The owner of the code are developers. Why do you want to separate actually the um, ownership of the quality of this code and, and send it to another team? It, it doesn't make sense. It creates all sorts of friction. So to me, this is more an appro um, the problem is more with the approach rather than with anything else. So what do we, how do we, how are we thinking about cleaning code at Sonar Source? What we are thinking about is really, first off, that developers should own this, and no, no question about it. So developers should own the practice of cleaning code. The second thing is that we should make a very simple rule in, uh, in development teams that no code is going to ship, sorry, no new code is going to ship if we are adding new problems. So kind of basic, what we are saying is developers should do a good job here. So no new critical problem, no new um, blocker problem. This is the only thing that we are doing. So it means that every time a developer is adding a line of code or changing a li an existing line of code, actually, there will be like a, a gate where it cannot go through if uh, it has new issues. And from there, it means naturally that all the new code is going to be clean, which is really cool. But it also has a second effect, which is the old code is also going to be remediated. And this is really important as we all have big like uh, legacy code or when it's, even when it's not legacy, uh, this is code that we have to maintain. This code is actually going to be clean simply by the fact that we keep changing the source code. Um, industry number says that companies change about, in average, 20% of their lines of code, of their baseline every year, which means that after one year, 20% of the code is going to be clean. After two years, probably there will be overlap, so it might be 30, 35% of the code which is clean. After five years, it might be 40 to 50% of the code which is clean. If you think about the effort that would be required, the budget that would be required in any organization to clean 50% of the code, it would be huge. Nobody would want to sign on this. Developer would resign, whatever. They, nobody would want to engage in such a project. So here what we are saying is that if you just control what is being done, when developers are doing it, you offer them this very short feedback loop then you are going to be able to remediate, so to first off produce code that is at the right level, which has all the nice characteristics that I mentioned earlier. So you will get these benefits, but also you will be able to remediate the existing code by simply changing the, the software. And at the end of the day, you should have happy developers because they we are not constrain, constraining these developers, and they are doing a better job, and they are improving their work environment. So really happy developer, happy teams, because it's going to be much easier to, um, to own the code collectively. Um, developers are probably going to stick around a little bit longer, and the teams are going to be able to really work on the interesting problem, not the just a rework or just fixing things that were introduced um, whenever. And happy enterprises, because we are, here we are talking about not only a lot of savings, but also the ability to leverage the, the software for what it is, which is an asset, rather than having to deal with all the flaws that were introduced in the past. So as I mentioned, clean code has really lots of benefits on hopefully uh, with this um, little introduction to clean code, you now uh, realize that what was not an option for you maybe when you entered here is not really optional 
um, for all the organizations. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Olivier. Okay, as we look to shape the next 25 years and beyond for Java, it's important to understand the delicate balance between two forces at play. On the one hand, there's a force that wants fast innovation and rapid evolution, embracing new industry trends. And on the other hand, the forces of stability, keeping existing programs running without break rate, breakage. There's an extremely low tolerance to incompatibility. The Java team tries to balance both of these aspects with evolution that supports new hardware and software architectures while remaining compatible and offering rock solid stability. Now, the numbers for Java speak for themselves, but they don't come from a vacuum. We build trust by doing our development in the OpenJDK community where you can understand the direction and the progress and see it as it happens. We bring predictability to our releases by delivering on time, as we have done through the six-month cadence for the last five years, both of which form the foundation for delivering innovation while retaining stability. Now, one of the greatest accelerators to adoption has been evolving Java's release model to the six-month cadence. Gone are the days of these disruptive Big Bang releases Rather, we now roll out Java predictably, like clockwork, twice a year in March and September. Now, of course, we haven't found a way of magically doing three years of work in six months. Rather, we deliver innovation in smaller, more frequent increments. And taken together, the result is actually a similar amount of improvement over time. It's just that it's delivered in more manageable pieces. So some noteworthy projects to mention. Amber. So with Amber, we look to make Java more approachable. Each new Amber feature aims to either make Java more readable and writable or to remove boilerplate and ceremony. Leiden aims to reduce startup and warm-up time so to help applications reach peak performance, which is especially helpful in the world of microservices. Loom. After first announcing the concept of Loom in 2017, with Java 19, we introduced virtual threads to offer tremendously better scalability. Project Panama, which simplifies the process of connecting Java programs with non-Java components. So in particular, Panama aims to enable straightforward communication between Java applications and C-based libraries which provides Java the ability for faster and easier communication with native libraries required for machine learning. Let's just go back, because um, I also want to mention Valhalla, which aims to improve memory representation of complex data by introducing value types. These are programmed like objects, but give you the performance of primitives. And finally, ZGC, which is a scalable, low-latency garbage collector capable of handling terabyte heaps with sub-millisecond max pause times. I encourage you to attend tomorrow's Java technical keynote as we dive deeper into many of these projects with expert-led demos. And to explore these topics further, I invite you to attend a range of sessions, tutorials, and hands-on labs that will afford you technical knowledge to begin using many of the project features we've developed in Java. Now, while developers choose a language and platform which supports them in delivering solutions, enterprises often have a need to uh, worry more or just as much about support and maintenance. The Java SE subscription from Oracle is tailored around supporting these organizations in ensuring that their production applications remain secure, stable, and performant so that their developers can focus on solving new business problems rather than maintaining their old solutions. 
And because this comes from the team that developed Java in the first place, you can rest assured that you get the best support available. Now, the success of this uh, subscription has been really broad. At this point, we have over 10,000 customers, and the renewal rates of this have just been outstanding. One of the additional benefits that you get with the subscription is the Java Management Service. So the Java Management Service is a fairly recently launched uh, uh, Oracle Cloud native service, which makes it possible for customers to gain insight and manage their Java deployments. JMS can help you manage systems on Oracle Cloud, on-premise, and even in other third-party clouds. It will create an inventory of all of the Java runtimes that are installed and notify you when there's an update or an upgrade which is available for any of those versions. It will also keep track of which application is using each Java runtime so that you can be sure you don't have any runtimes that are installed but not used and that no application is running on a different version than you intended. Customers can also use JMS to install and remove Java versions in their managed systems. So being a cloud service, JMS receives updates in a very rapid cadence. You can uh, see shortly um, improvements coming that will allow customers to gain a deeper understanding of what their applications are doing. JMS will help you figure out what cryptographic algorithms are used, what third-party libraries your applications rely on, uh, and through the use of the Java Flight Recorder, um, you'll be able to gather information about application performance. Of course, all of this is available to users of the Java SE subscription and to those running Java in OCI. But as an added benefit to all Java users, I'm happy to announce that the JMS Discovery Service is now available to everyone to use, even without a subscription. Many users have asked us before to help them understand their Java usage before they become subscribers. And to help with this, today we're announcing that the basic discovery features of JMS are now available for everyone, even if they're not subscribers or running in OCI. The more advanced features will remain available just for subscription customers. But note that JMS releases are independent of the Oracle JDK versions and generally much more frequent. Some areas we're continuously working on are crypto usage, third-party library use, Java flight recording information, Java application server insights, and also custom customizable installations. Now, sometimes it's hard to fathom just how much performance improvement developers gain by moving to more modern versions of Java. With each new release, beyond the set of features, and thousands, there are thousands of performance enhancements that you get right out of the box just by upgrading that your application can take advantage of. In fact, between Java 8 and Java 17, our partner benchmarking has shown improvements of 64%. But we understand that sometimes upgrading versions can prove challenging, making it hard to take advantage of the performance gains that these new versions offer. To help customers address this challenge, I'm happy to announce the availability of the Java SE subscription Enterprise Performance Pack. This drop-in replacement allows you to get the performance of Java 17 for workloads which need to keep running on Java 8. And in order to uh, tell you a little bit about their experiences with this, I'm very happy to welcome to the stage Narain Nayak from Ampere and Michael Wiedstedt from the Oracle JVM team. Well, thank you for having me here to my first Java One. I'm thrilled to be here. Ampere and Oracle have been close partners for over three years now. Uh, not many people know that Oracle Cloud was our first large deployment of Ampere's cloud-native ultra processors. And since then, we've worked closely on hardware software co-design, and I'm here to share with you some of the fruits of that labor. 
What is the Ampere Ultra Processor? The Ampere Ultra Processor was built from the ground up for cloud native applications. And based on what George says, some of them might have been written in Java. As you can see on the screen, on popular cloud applications like Spark and enterprise class Java benchmarks, we see large performance improvements, which for developers such as yourselves, you need fewer resources to achieve your goals. On applications with stringent SLA requirements like Cassandra, we have seen huge drops in 99 percentile latencies, which as you very well know, is a lot more difficult than just improving throughput. And finally, this allows for much better price performance, up to 46% in our measurements. When you run your applications with the enterprise performance pack on OCI's Ampere A1 instances. Now, it's fantastic to see all of these improvements on benchmarks and workloads, but we all really know what matters is applications deployed at scale. Towards that end, we work not only with George's Java platform group, but with a bunch of groups inside of Oracle, one of which is the Fusion Cloud Application team. And this team has been raving recently about the improvements they've seen with the performance pack on OCI instances, up to 40% with a reduction in use of resources like heap size and CPU utilization. Now, the performance engineer in me is excited to see these improvements, uh, but the software developer in me is impressed that these can be achieved with just a drop-in of the enterprise performance package. So to summarize what all of this means is, if you use the performance pack on OCI's Ampere A1 compute instances, your wallet will thank you, and so will the environment. OK, so another team uh, we have, which uh, recently has been working with your JVM team, Michael, um, is the Oracle Advertising Group. So why don't you tell us about their experience? Yeah, so they decided to take Performance Pack for a spin. And without making any changes, so no changes to code, not to configuration, not to tooling, they just dropped it in. And they immediately saw 20% improvements. That's both to performance and to resource usage. But they didn't stop there. So with some very minimal tuning and minimal effort, uh, they got another 10% on top of that. And this is on real applications, not synthetic benchmarks. Excellent. Well, that's super exciting. Thank you so much. And thank you, Narain. Thanks. OK. As we head towards the later part of the keynote, um, along with technology leadership and enterprise value, the third key pillar for Java's continuing success is community. And there's no better reflection of the power of community, uh, the power of community than the OpenJDK community. It's here where Oracle openly and transparently develops Java, and we invite others to come and contribute and participate with us um, to make life even easier. We've actually updated the URL so you can find it, uh, so you can update your benchmarks now to openjdk.org. Simple, clean, and easy to remember. Um, oh, let's see. Uh, by the way, can we go back one? Does anyone remember this Duke version? It's, uh, it's actually one of my favorites. It's one of the original designs from 20, over 27 years ago. Uh, and as you'll see throughout, the, uh, throughout Java 1 conference, Duke is the embodiment of the Java community. Um, so looking a little bit at OpenJDK contributions, we always like to take the time to thank all of the folks who uh, have contributed and been involved uh, for each release. Um, this shows you a, a, a little bit of a map over folks who were involved um, in bringing Java 19 to you. Now, as you can see, uh, the list of companies and individuals contributing to OpenJDK continues to grow. It includes hardware vendors, uh, advanced users of Java, and even a few companies who want to make their own distributions. And of course, we have Oracle, who, as the stewards of Java, continue to contribute more than all of the others combined, leading the evolution projects, which I mentioned earlier. Another area where Oracle has been contributing to open source is the GraalVM community. And in order to talk about that a little bit, please help me extend a warm welcome to the technical director of Oracle Labs, Eric Sedlar. So 
So Eric GraalVM is an exciting project with a lot of momentum used by popular microservice frameworks for fast startup of Java applications. What are you announcing today? I'm pleased to announce that Oracle intends to contribute all the Java-related code from GraalVM Community Edition to the OpenJDK community. Further, we intend to uh, <laughs> continue our design and development work on the, the Graal JIT compiler and GraalVM native image uh, technology in the OpenJDK community using the same methodology and processes uh, that we use for Java. And finally, we are intending to uh, now align future releases of GraalVM with the Oracle Java release model and licensing. All right. Uh, what do we think? Good? Awesome. All right. So, um, so Michael, uh, the JVM team from, uh, from the Java group that's been working on Hotspot for many years. What, tell, tell us about how you see the potential for collaboration here. Yeah, so my team has been working on Java since 1995 and in the OpenJDK community since its start. So we're very much looking forward to welcoming all the Graal VMCE contributors. And together we'll embrace the kind of balance of innovation and stewardship that in the end really is uh, driving that thoughtful innovation and evolution that has made Java an enduring success. All right. So uh, now, in order to learn a little bit more about Oracle's Java community stewardship, I'd like to invite someone from my team who has spent many, many years ensuring that the Java community heartbeat stays strong. Please help me welcome Mr. Java community, Sharat Shonder. Welcome to Java One, and as George said, we're back. Now, before we start, can I have everyone stand up? Everyone stand up? Okay. I'd like to ask a question. If you've been using Java, for at least one year, remain standing. OK, good, no one sat down. If you've been using Java for five years, remain standing. Hmm, only a couple people, all right. Here's where it's going to get interesting. If you've been using Java for 10 years, remain standing. Oh. That's still quite a bit of people, okay. If you've been using Java for 20 years, please remain standing. All right, if you've been using Java for 25 years, at least 25 years, remain standing. Now here's the tricky question. If you've been using Java for 27 years, Please remain standing. Huh. I don't think I should be doing this keynote. Maybe we should have them come up on stage. So that was an important moment, because we have three storylines here at Java One. The first one is technology innovation. The second one is enterprise value. And the third one, for me, is the most important pillar within that storyline, and that's the community. Some very smart people in the past realized to build out the largest collection of developers, you had to connect. You had to make it personal. You had to make it engaging. You had to make it interactive. And we are standing on the shoulders of giants. And we thank them for realizing what gives life to Java? It's you. Each of you have played a role in getting us here over the past 27 years. And each of you will have a role in ensuring Java stays vibrant for the next 27 years. And there's no better way to indicate that than what happened this summer the one millionth Java certification was completed. And that is a demonstration of just how important Java is to stand out. 
to businesses, to companies that make them realize just the value you have as a programmer. Now, there are things that are foundational that has brought us here. Programs that are rooted in the history of Java, that are all about that cooperation and that collaboration. And many of you have played a part in that. Driving some of these programs, participating in these programs, sharing in these programs. If I may ask, if you are a Java user group leader, may I have you stand up? OK, we owe you a debt of honor. It's your passion, your commitment, your energy that makes Java so vibrant in local communities. You have meetups, you have engagements, you bring new people in to increase participation. There's another special group of people here, too. They openly, they authentically, they truthfully speak about Java. They are extensions of our voice. If you are a Java champion, please rise so we can acknowledge you. Now, there are many new members to this program. Over the last two years, we've added 50 luminaries to the Java Champion program. And that is a testament to just how much talent there is out there. Now, does anyone have a camera? Uh, did I say that? Does everyone have a cell phone? If you could, take out your cell phone, take a picture of this screen, and if you're on Twitter, post it there with the hashtag Java1. And during the conference, I am going to find someone who has posted this. And they will receive this very special commemorative Java coin. It's not Bitcoin. It's worth more than that. It is priceless. <laughs> so I'll be finding you somewhere in the conference. So please do share this and tag the people that you know. They may be a friend, a colleague, someone that has helped shape and give you a better understanding of how to use Java. Now, we all know the saying, it takes a village to raise a child. It also takes a team to ensure the Java community stays vibrant. And I'm so proud that Oracle has reinvested into a dedicated Java developer relations team that not only invests in customers, but in communities to ensure we push the boundaries of expanding our rich and vibrant Java community. My peers, I ask you to stand up, because I owe you also a debt of honor. I ask that you find them. Find them in the conference, in a session, in a lab, in the exhibition hall, in the hallway track. We are there to not only spread knowledge, but more importantly, we are there to listen to you. And I think that fundamentally is the most important role in developer relations, is to listen. I would also like to acknowledge a special member of our team, Dennis, Dennis Megagon, who's in Ukraine, who could not be here physically, but will be making a special appearance tomorrow online. Dennis, if you're listening, if you're watching, we just want to say thank you for preparing us for Java One with all your time and investments. Thank you, Dennis. Now, it's been five years since we've had Java 1, and many of you may have forgotten, but we end Java 1 with a community keynote, and we are bringing that back this year. So on Thursday, I ask you to please come and attend the community keynote, where we're going to learn about the new programs that we're investing in, beyond the foundational ones, to connect, to communicate, to collaborate, both online and in person. We'll cover topics like Java and education so we can ensure what is that next generation behind us that we need to empower? What are those steps that we need to take as a community to galvanize around? 
And most importantly, how can we contribute back to Java? Because we all play a special role. You can learn about all of those programs from the luminaries, and not just from Oracle and the Java team, but from the industry and the Java ecosystem. So please, come and attend. Now, we couldn't have a Java One without our sponsors. I'd like to thank Sonar again this morning for their keynote. Thank you, Sonar. And tomorrow, we also have Microsoft here as well. So all of those Microsoft fans, our colleagues over there, thank you for also becoming part of the Java family this year. Now, a couple of housekeeping items I'd like to cover. One is, we have a reception here tonight in the exhibition hall here in Caesars Forum for you to meet not just each other, but the Java team. We'll be walking around. Please connect with us. Please speak with us. Please find us. One of the most important things you can do before you leave here is to meet somebody new. I know it's sometimes comfortable to hang with a team in a group that you've probably come here with, but how do we expand that participation? It's by finding someone you don't know. So look around. Find someone. Connect with them. Meet us in the reception hall tonight for this, uh, for this activity. Now, for those that are a little bit more daring, do we have any runners in the audience? OK, so I'm going to be following all of you. Please join us tomorrow for a morning run at 6 AM. I know we're developers. We don't sleep, right? And it's Vegas. Vegas never sleeps, right? So we're going to do a four-mile loop of Vegas. 6 AM, I encourage you to be there, get the blood flowing, re-energize, and start your day with a bit of energy. Now, as I said, community to me is the most important pillar of this Java 1 and Java storyline. Many of you played a part in that sharing and in that nurturing. And I appreciate all of you for that. But there's a special individual that we want to recognize. This individual has helped children learn the value and the opportunities of programming. This person has invested his own personal time to help us all grow our Java careers. This person has traveled the world, educating others, building communities. And here on the Java team, led by George Saab, and the Java Developer Relations team, led by Chad Armora, we would like to give a lifetime achievement recognition to Bruno Souza. Congratulations. Thank you, man. Thank you. Thank you. I know. Thank you so much. Bruno Obrigado. <laughs> so, you, you have anything to say, Bruno? I don't know. <laughs> So, um, thank you. Thank you. You know, it's not, not for this achievement here, not, not for this award, but thank you for you guys doing the right thing. Right? I think that uh, Java has been an amazing, you know, you saw how many people have been doing Java for so long, right? It has been amazing for our careers. You know, we made um, our lives, right? Our families uh, by doing Java, right? And we changed the world. You know, we were discussing yesterday, um, you know, how new languages are coming and, and how sometimes we have difficulty with the new generation, for example, of Java. But in reality, uh, if you look uh, how software development was done 25 years ago, it's completely different. There's nothing like we did in the past, right? You know, we completely changed the way we develop software. And, and we did that because you guys did that. Right? Because we did new things. We, we, we solved new challenges. We, you know, we, we, we kind of uh, accepted the challenges, right? To go and do all of that. And I think that because of you, 
um, Java has grown so much and so powerful and has is being able to do so many things that it's even hard for us to tell new people how important it is, right? And I think that, uh, you know, so that's, you know, this here is for all of you for being doing this, for, for being investing in your time, your lives in this awesome technology. And for you guys here, thank you for doing the right thing because that's what we need. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we couldn't have a Java One without acknowledging the various communities around the world. So if you're, especially from, is Brazil here? Is Brazil here? I couldn't think of any better way to end our opening keynote than the focus on community. So remember that as you're here to learn, to advance your Java skills, you're also here to advance your connections. And so we thank you for coming to our keynote, and we hope you have a great Java one. Enjoy the show.